What do we do though, even more for parents when we have this bad influence person? Well, we, I think this is an important thing for all of us to do on a regular basis, but we have to know what we want in a friendship. So what do you have to have in a friendship? And asking young people this question is profound. So I do this regularly. I list three characteristics of friendship that is most important to you. Young people are pretty much going to say trust, loyalty, and be myself. This is where you can get more granular, right? Emotional granularity of, well, what does trust look like to you? What does loyalty look like to you? Uh, and use the definition, um, consider using the definitions that I talked about a few minutes ago of, is it just going along with somebody because the relationship is the most important or is it tr speaking truth to them, even if it's uncomfortable? And then of course the question is, well, how do you trust a friend if you aren't actually comfortable saying what you really feel to them? So you, it really gets to some deep, deep conversations as a teacher or as a parent when you're going through this with them. Then it is what can you not have in a friendship? What's your, what are your unbreakables? And list three characteristic, characteristics of a friendship you would consider pausing the friendship. Now, I said pause. Pausing is a really important word because young people, we all need this, of it's just too much to make a decision about like, I'm done, right? It's really rare for us to be able to do that. And so especially in the beginning when we're establishing boundaries and relationships and friendships. So get, you, I use the word pause to great success with young people that we're just, the pause could be two seconds, two minutes to, you know, a pause in your math class it could be 20 seconds. It could be two minutes, it could be 20 minutes, it could be two months, it could be two years. It doesn't matter. It's just, we're just calling it a pause. So you can ask your children, like, let's have some answers about what, what are the three characteristics? And then of course the question is, well, let's look at these two things that you've answered. Not what I've answered, what you've answered. Are you getting what you have to have in a friendship? And if you're not, what is the price of having this friendship? And what would be the price of not having the friendship? And we can't fix things right away, right? Like, you know, like having the child say, oh, I understand it's a bad relationship. We just, sometimes we want children to be uncomfortable and to be able to walk away with like, oh, my mom, dad just asked me, my grandma just asked me a really, that's weird. That's a, that's a hard question. I need to think about that. And then we can loop back the other day because uh, another day, because remember these conversations are like a lot for young people. So we want them short. We want a lot of them short, unless they want to talk to us. What is the advice? If your child gets rejected, I don't care what kind of friendship it is, but they're hurt by it. Number one, you want to do, you want to validate maybe a little relating, right? But you want it to be invitation. Like, Hey, you know, I, I had a really hard time in seventh grade um, with a friend. You want to hear about it? Okay. Let them feel the feels, right? Let them have those feelings, the messy feelings, and then and encourage them to like, if they say, I'm so mad, I'm so sad, say, you know, what are some other words that, you know, really describe what you're feeling? Like, I really don't want to make assumptions. So I, if you want to tell me, I'd love to know more about what you're feeling. Remind them that emotions can change. They're not going to be stuck in this forever. Go over their friendship must-haves, like I just did a few minutes ago. Ask them what would be the price to get back into the friendship? Because one of the things we want young people to realize is if a child, if they have a friend who's, who's sort of dumped them or to sort of, you know, and they're like, wait, what just happened? Like they were my best friend last year and now they won't talk to me or they're much closer to the other people. One of the most important things we can say to children is in order to get back into the friendship, what would you have to do to be able to do it? Is that worth it to you? And really, you know, that's these, those are the questions and conversations that we could, that could be life transforming for young people that no matter what friendships they're having or relationships that are having, no matter how intimate, what is the price to maintain the friendship? And is it worth it? Ask them because <clears throat> they're going to be worried about, especially with FOMO and Snapchat and knowing where their friends are all the time. Um, Ask them about one specific thing that they can do when they go back to school or they're, you know, pick up their phone. What is like, what is one thing they can do to make themselves proud? So one thing that they could do to make themselves proud is not go on Snapchat and see where their friends are. So it's, or one thing they can do in the hallway or one thing they could do in a classroom if they have, you know, a group of friends um, that are there and they're not as close to anymore. So one thing that they can do to make themselves proud. What do you think is the most, um, egregious thing what's the biggest mistake that parents make when it comes to talking about friendships oh good question Linda. um i think making assumptions or and not and not listening so you start to hear what they're saying 
And then um, you start making assumptions and others, well, <laughs> there's a couple of things. First of all, when they start telling a story um, that saying, well, where were you? What happened? What did they say? Where was the teacher if it was on, in the school? Um, what did the other parents do? All of those kinds of questions are coming from a place of anxiety for you, but they come across as interrogation to the child. So um, when, a, when you hear something that's upsetting, it's really helpful to say just for a default for yourself, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Thank you for telling me because thank you for trusting me to tell me because I like that's a huge thing. And, you know, the more and then you can start saying things like if they're talking in generalities, well, I don't want to make assumptions about what you're talking about. So if you feel comfortable, I'd love to hear more specifics. So I understand this better. Um, and so I think that thing of interrogating is incredibly important to watch yourself. And if you find yourself doing it, you can stop and say, oh, wait, hold on one second. Hold on. I'm asking you too many questions. Hold on. I actually just need to listen to you and pause yourself and stop. Um, Michael, I know you've got a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rosalind, what are uh, some key reminders that are valuable when teaching students about maintaining others' dignity? Oh, can you say that again? Because that's such a big question. I want to make sure what are, I'm. Yeah. What are some What are some focal points or things that are priorities to really remember or utilize when trying to guide students or our children about maintaining others' dignity? Okay, so I make a distinction between respect and dignity, and schools use the word dignity a lot. And um, so, let me give you an example: is that if you're in middle school. I mean, it could be elementary school too, but at any age. And the child has been really mean to your, your, to your child, to us. If you're, let me, let me back up. Okay. You're a teacher. A child comes to you and says, these kids are being really, really mean to me. And they used to be friends. Um, one of the things that we can often, because we've been trained to say this is you don't have to be friends with those kids, but you do need to treat them with respect. And I actually really challenge that because I don't want children respecting the actions of somebody who is taking away the dignity of someone else. Mm. Respect is earned, actually. The definition of, of respect is to look back at someone's actions and admire them. So positions that people have, um, there's this assumption that we just need to treat people with respect because, and, and really connected to the definition of admiring the way they act. The problem is, is that people will take the positions that they have or the position of respect that they have based on their position and use it to take away the dignity of other people, their essential worth. Dignity is a given, respect is earned. And I know that that can be different than the way that we were raised, by the way. But the way that I want you to think about it is the way you treat someone with respect, the way you treat someone with dignity actually looks the same. But when you have to treat, when you have to show respect to somebody who is taking the way the dignity of someone else, you feel angry, resentful. You feel that that person has somehow got away with something that you feel complicit in this dynamic. So often respect is in our language and in our culture is about power. It is not about equity. And so using the word dignity is actually much more powerful in these situations. So to say, you don't have to be friends with those kids, but you do need to treat them with dignity. And for example, that means you can't go after them on social media. And so it's, or, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, right? You can get very granular. You can go from this big concept of dignity to being very granular about what would be the things that you would do that you could treat them with dignity. The thing that kids don't, young people don't like to hear is you have to respect somebody who is being mean, who is being degrading to other people. And it literally doesn't make sense to them. And so it's one of the things, the reasons why they disengage from us when we talk to them about their friendships and relationships, because they actually do understand that, re that respect is often about power. So let me just be to reaffirm, I'm not saying don't use the word respect. What I am saying is we need to use it correctly. And we need to use the word dignity more often in our language with young people, because it is much more powerful to correctly use both words. Uh, Rosalyn, you've got a question here. What is meant by validate, don't relate? So lot, we, many, especially women, frankly, have been raised to say, to think that, oh, like when someone's going through a hard time that you say, oh my gosh, 
I know what it's like to be you. I've gone through the same thing. And then you, in this way of bonding, are going to tell the person your experience. And that actually does not work. <laughs> it actually disengages people a lot because they think you don't know what it's like to be me. And you're now telling your story. And I had a story. And that story is very important to me. And now you're talking to me about your story. So I don't want to hear your story. And so it disengages people. So validate means your experience, I acknowledge your experience is important and our experiences are actually not the same. And so when I say, when your child comes to you with a problem, you can validate them and say, I am so sorry that happened to you. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for trusting me. Because it is a leap of faith to, for, especially for children to tell their parents or a teacher, because we're going to do something about it. Maybe like that's scary. So it's, it is saying, I, 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 I'm so sorry that happened to you. Thank you for trusting me. And together, if you want, like we'll think about what we can do to make this better for you or you have more control. Instead of saying, oh, I went through an experience like you. I know it's exactly, let me tell you my story. So when I say validate, maybe a little relating, it's you validate. And then after that, you say, you know, I had a similar experience when I was in seventh grade. Do you want to hear it? Or in ninth, whatever the grade is that the child is. <clears throat> Um, can you very quickly, um, is there a distinction uh, to make in these conversations when the child brings uh, in the questions about a romantic partner? Yeah, so actually not really. <laughs> it's a funny thing, but not really. Like when you think about like the exercise I did, let's do this one. We'll go back to here. How important do you think it would have been for any of us on this call? when we were 13 years old to, to do this as a friendship. And then as we got older and we checked in and we were beginning to have more intimate relationships and we we're starting to date people. Um, I don't care how long that date lasts, two minutes to right? I don't, I'm very agnostic about how long it lasts. It is, so what do you, what do you have to have in a intimate interaction with somebody? What do you have to have? So we start with the building blocks of friendship and then we, we develop that, right? As young people get older and their lives are more complex. And I mean, my goodness, there are lots of young people who are using dating apps. This is like, there are a lot of young people in high school using dating apps. So what do you want when you can use this when they are thinking about their relationships? I want to be myself. I mean, honestly, not to, I mean, I, I, but I'm going to say it is there are middle school people who obviously are misrepresenting themselves in their age on those dating apps. Mm -hmm. Be myself. This is a totally different way to get into those incredibly difficult, scary conversations in a way that young people are like, wait, I want to be myself. What does that mean? I want to be in control of who I am and how I present myself. So we don't want to shame young people as they go through their development. And we want to be re really a a appropriately um, responsive to the complexity of their lives. And so starting with these friendship criteria and then building them as their lives get more complex is really important, really important. This is the kind of repet for teachers. This is the kind of appropriate repetition as they get older that is the, where they are seeing the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That that going to school has a purpose. <laughs> um, you've got a specific question here. What do we do with a kid who has withdrawn from having friendships after experiencing a lot of rejection? Yeah, yeah. So you, you can't, so here's, a, they have to have a sense of agency over the choices that they're making with their friends. I would think if they're online at lots of kids who are you're describing with this characteristic will find a community online that is really helpful to them. Right. Now, there is a very understandable concern about the danger of those people, not necessarily for, for sexual predation, but for, you know, there, are, as we well know, that there are people who can make a young person feel a sense of belonging, who have um, a way of looking at the world that is very, very frightening. And, um, and so we want young people, that's why it's so important to be able to v validate, validate the, the, re the motivation and need to create a sense of belonging somewhere in their lives. So it, you might not want that group of people, but don't be real careful about not um, coming across as thinking that the need is not important. The need is the most important. Mm -hmm. So when you have a young person who's been rejected in real life, 
I would say that you to really help them think about finding an online community is fine as long as you have some supervision about what that community is about right. and then validate that community. And that dignity stuff is really important because that baseline of whoever you meet online, the feeling of essential worth for all people is absolutely the most important thing for me. So you see what I'm, now what you're doing or what I'm doing is showing you how to do family values about dignity connected to how they are reaching out to people online in a situation where their real life um, friends or they've gotten a lot of rejection in their real, real life. And the more maybe confidence they can have and integrity that they can have in some of the relationships they have online can actually really help them in their real life trying again to create organic friendships. But get, get, let them have a little bit of a pause on the friendships and the situations that are giving them so much anxiety and hurt. Uh, Michael, I'm about to make some closing comments. Did you want to say anything before well, we say I, goodbye? I have a question. I have a question I wanted to ask people. Can I do that before I go? Well, please, yes, oh, yes. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, so in the chat, I would love for you to answer this question because everybody in this room, who's in this virtual room, has a tremendous amount of expertise and experience and thought and care and so what did you come in knowing today, but now see differently? So I'd love for you to put that in the chat. I'll give you, you know, 30, oh, we're over our time a little bit, 30 seconds. If you could put that in the chat. And as you're doing that, so what did you come in knowing today, but now see differently? Which teachers, by the way, is like my favorite, favorite, favorite. You know how we have favorite questions? Like this is my new favorite, favorite question. <clears throat> So what I want to leave you with is, remember parents, right? This is more for our parenting heads. You do not have to fix everything. Opportunities are going to come. This is a process and you're present in the moment and you're help, but to help them for a lifetime. You're present in the moment to help them for a, life, in a, for a lifetime. All right. Now, that was the question I wanted to ask and I can see it in the chat. You guys are doing, you all are doing a fantastic job. Thank you so much. I'll be back later tonight for part two, round two. <laughs> and thank you so much for being with me in the middle of the day. Oh, you're muted, dear. <laughs> we all want to call someone and text someone. Be sure you're not on mute when you do that and tell them that they need to be back here at 7 p.m. because Rosalind, you are who you are. I mean, your books have really started the conversations that we all wanted to have and didn't know how to have, and you're still doing it. And I, I'm so, so delighted that you could spend the time with us today at the Glenbar Parent Series. So I'm glad that I had the opportunity to listen to this twice because there is so much there but uh, what I really got in touch with how you took us back to understand the complexity of these intense feelings. Um, it's easy to forget that. So I thought that was really, really positive. And then certainly those takeaways about understanding that the that, that importance of validating, uh, that relating, ask them to ask you to help to, to relate with them, be prepared to change from what you hear. I especially love what you talked about uh, what drives them this, I mean, and that example was outstanding about social pain, embarrassment, humiliation, shame. This is a top priority. They'll do anything at the expense of that. I love when you talk about what a healthy relationship looks like and what a toxic relationships. And of course, we can't talk about emotions often enough um, that they're not permanent, but feel them, help them find the vocabulary so that when in finding and sharing with you, that will help so much. I love when you talked about getting them to really what is a health, what, what, um, what are the, uh, what are, what are the um, boundaries? What are the, um, <laughs> the lines they won't cross? Okay, I'll stop now. Uh, Isabel, <laughs> answer your question. I had to get Hi, that Isabel. out. Hi, Go. Isabel. Hi, thank you so much for the amazing presentation. I'm Isabel and I'm a senior at Matia Valley High School. And I was wondering, what do you wish kids better understood about friendships? What, what was the last thing you said? What do you wish kids better understood about friendships? Oh, what I wish they understood is that they don't have to put up with a friendship where they are sacrificing 
um, what they think is important and how they're being treated to maintain the friendship. I think that's, you know, I've watched for so many years, you know, this thing of um, maintaining the friendship at all costs. And it's a, sometimes it's a really high cost. And I, I really wish that young people would feel that, feel that feeling of, excuse me, that they have the right to be treated with dignity in their friendships. And, um, and then the other, the last thing I would say is that I think young people, and we all do this, get confused and understandably so, that the closer you are to somebody, the less conflict you have, but actually that's not true at all. That, the, that when you're in, you're in close relationship with people, that actually means that your chances of having conflict goes up because you're in relationship with people. And so having deep friendships is pretty much gonna require having moments of real conflict. Thank you so much. Anything you disagreed with, Isabel? Anything you wanted to make sure that, or something that I said that you really want adults to hear, like, you know, or something that you disagree with, anything like that? I definitely agree with having to recognize the boundaries of when people are sacrificing you know, what's really important for friendships. For instance, I recently was in a situation like that, and it took a while for me to see that the friendship I was in wasn't really working for me because I felt like I had to sacrifice a large amount of just like having a positive relationship with someone else. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in the Q and A, my middle schooler has been excluded from her friend group. We've done things to help, but she constantly tells us she can't find new friends to hang out with because everyone's already in a friend group. There's no room. Right. She wants. <laughs> right. I mean, this is the complexity of right of middle. So. I really would encourage you to do what I did with your daughter. Um, I think it's a daughter. I can't, what, your child, about what are the three characteristics they have in a friend, that they have to have in a friendship and what are the three that they can't have? And then say, okay, so who do you think in your life has these things? And I would also take pressure off of her um, to, like, uh, of the groups that are, that are in schools. And so here's the thing that happens with people like me. We say, well, go find friends in other places, right? Go sign her up for other things or whatever. Go, go, you know, that kind of stuff. That's too superficial of an answer for a middle school person, frankly. I, I really think that because it's complex. And so when I say, I just, that take the pressure off of trying to find, um, find a group or for her to find a group in her school, what I mean by that, to be very specific, is when you try, um, it look young people in their development. A lot of young people, even our children that we love and our good kids and all that stuff, that um, they often do not are not kind about when they recognize that a child is trying too hard to get into a group. So I really don't. I really would advise a child not to try. Right, try so hard to get into the group and back off on the pressure of that for her and then do that character, those characteristics and then ask her, where do you think we can find people like that? And where are those people in your life? And so that you're, you're taking the pressure off these specific situations. Um, and then if it happens in school, then it organically will happen. And you know, in middle school that, you know, there are times seventh grade, for example, oftentimes in ninth grade, where they, they have an, an influx of new students that come in and then the groups change. So it's, um, or modify, for example, or expand or contract, or whatever. So, but for her right now, the feeling is these, the, you know, and this needs to be affirmed is these groups are not changing. And so affirm her and say, okay, like I, I hear you about this. I really, and I can imagine that's really, really hard. So let's take a step back and figure out what you want in a friendship and then get some, so that you can have some control over the situation. You've got another question here in the chat. When kids move to a new friend group, is it possible then to maintain the friendships from the past or is that too complex mm -hmm. at the middle school age? Yeah, some kids can do it. Um, some kids can do it. And so that's why I said in the healthy relationships, that's why it's really important to say to middle school kids um, that people don't, that um, what was the phrase that I used is that they don't make you choose sides or choose friends. And for me in middle school, that would be a absolute like 
like that would be something I would want my child to realize is when you have people who are making you choose, it's me or them, that is a person who's using loyalty as a way that I is not fitting with my family values, right? It doesn't fit with like, like you're not allowed to have other friends. And, um, and so I would unpack that with your, um, with your child about what would be the reason that somebody would say, you can't be, you can't be friends with these other people. And then what is the cost? Again, I, you'll see it. There's a theme I always do is like, so, and then also what's the cost? What's the price of staying in one and having one friend group? And what's the price of having lots of friends? Um, and so that I want them to be able to see, what I want is for young people to be able to see the lay of the land and make it more clear for them so that they can make their own decisions. And so our job is to ask them the question so they can see the lay of the land more clearly. This, this afternoon, you talked about how um, it's not that different really in romantic relationships or uh, right. you know, best friend. Uh, um, but here's a question. Um, I have this belief that the more I disapprove of my child's boyfriend, this will per push that relationship to a stronger place. Definitely. <laughs> because they're so busy fighting you and it's developmentally appropriate, right? It is developmentally appropriate. It's annoying and it's frustrating and it's scary sometimes, but it is developmentally appropriate, which is why I want you to not focus on the person, like the easy on people, hard on ideas, um, so that you can focus on what you want your child to learn about relationships instead of the person, um, yeah. because our kids know when we're judging. And they will be so focused on the judgment that they will not hear the wisdom of our words. So right. like really focus on what you, what do you want your child to learn about being in relationship, regardless of who it's with? Beautiful. Sherilyn, I know you have a question. I do, I do. Um, something I heard you say a couple of times that really stuck with me, I wrote down, wrote it down twice. Emotions are real, but emotions mm. can change. Mm. My, my question as a parent to your child, how do you remind your kids that emotions can change without sounding condescending? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a good question. So, I mean, what I do actually is I say on a scale of like one to a thousand, this is one thing I do. I sound like on a scale of one to a thousand, how miserable are you right now? Like, are you at 99% misery? Well, that's what you're feeling right now. And I would like for us to consider or for you to go from 999 to like 950. And so, and your emotions, when, if you feel it and you talk about it and you can describe it, then the, then the tendency is for things to get where you can process it. And, and we process feelings, right? Emotions are physiological feelings are the result of those is that we process these things all the time. Like you've been angry, very like, you could use example, like uh, in your own life, you've been very, very, very angry, like child of mine, dear daughter of mine, dear son. Remember the time when you were so angry at me, you like could barely look at me. Remember that time? Okay. I'm not saying I wasn't annoying. I wasn't saying, I'm not saying I didn't, I did not, you know, deserve that anger, but are you that angry at me now? No. Right. We move through emotions. We move through emotions. So we want to get you from 999 to 950. Going from 999 to 200% misery, not, not, not realistic. Doesn't go that fast. We just want you going in this, just gradually descending. And as you process your feelings, that will happen. Love it. Thank you. Rosalind, uh, this is your last question. Yes, you are in You are <laughs> in the elevator with the parent and you hear them sighing and you have oh. this sense that, that you want to say something to them because you just have a feeling that just a couple <laughs> of words is going to make them sigh a little less. What are you going <laughs> to say? Oh my God. Well, you know, what's funny is that I'm a ter I, not terrible. I am a consummate sire. Like my children, when I sigh, get so irritated with me. They are, and they're so primely sensitive to my sighing. It just happened to me actually a little bit ago. <laughs> Um, I mean, like last weekend I saw, it. so actually I'm just going to use this. There we go. I'm going to use this actually as a way to, as my elevator speech, actually. So I don't know if you did like, thank you for this. You don't have to fix everything and you can't opportunities are going to come. 
right? So you don't have to listen to this webinar and then go or read a book, like I said a few minutes ago, and then run and start talking to them about stuff because that they're on to you. They're like, especially if you have like enthusiastic eyes or intense eyes, they awesome. know us. They're like, get away with your enthusiastic eyes. Like you've read a parenting book, like just it's too much. So just just wait and have faith that opportunities will come for you to quickly, right? Two minutes, not two hours two minutes of just sharing, like having opportunities to share some of the things we've talked about or some of the wisdom that you've collected. This is a process. You are in a long road with these children. You're gonna tell them to fill the dishwasher 4,000 times. You're not gonna do 4,000 times in one time, like that doesn't stop. You're gonna have a whole, like I, as far as I can tell, my entire life with my children is gonna be telling them to fill the dishwasher. So this is a process. And especially for friendships who are present in the moment to help them for a lifetime. Yeah. You're present in the moment to help them for a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. So many good reminders. There's nothing more important than the relationship with your child. Do whatever you can to build that and strengthen that by listening more, validating more, relating only when they ask you. I loved it. Thank you. Lots of, uh, lots of, I loves you. I love you's going on oh, here. Thank you. Thank you so no. much, you all. And easy to get a hold of me if you need anything. And, um, and thank you so much, Glenbar. I like that you just, you all do such a wonderful job and you are such an important resource in the country. So that is recognized by me. It is recognized by many people in my field. And um, we just, you're just an invaluable resource um, to us. It's an honor to host you, Rosalind. I learned from you. We all do. This is where we go hug the kids and we send a heartfelt thank you to you, Rosalind. Be well. You're thank welcome. You, You're welcome. Bye, everybody. See you later. Have a great night.